Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, the Friday edition, the allergy edition. We're sneezing here. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today's March 23rd, 2018. So we should warn you before we get too far into the show that for some reason the pollen is going on down in Florida. Uh, I think there's dog hair or cat hair floating around my office. And so George is coughing every once in a while, and I sound a little stuffed up. I'm sure my face is red. It's allergy season, even though my family just survived another nor'easter four weeks in a row. 18 inches of, well, no, that didn't show. It was forecasted for 18 inches right out here outside. Jim Cantor from the Weather Channel. Hey, we want to park our weather truck out for here. You know, okay, sure. How bad could it be? I went to the store. I got the bread, got the milk, got the eggs. Something that would keep us safe for years to come or weeks. Uh, it was a no-show. It was a dud. We got two and a half inches, George. I'm sure you're up to 80s down there by now. No, Kevin. Uh, your nor'easter has dropped our temperatures into the low 70s from the high 70s. Uh, but has it allowed the pollen to keep spreading farther and wider? So the magnolia and bloom and the for bougainvillea and the forsythia, all these things are going. And the, uh, the oak trees are also pollinating right now. It's it's beautiful outside, but it's difficult to breathe. There's a fine yellow mist on your car in the morning. Uh, the yes. I, I remember when we lived in Alabama, that was the thing you'd come out and see in, in March and April was the, the fine yellow. Uh, it looked like dust, but you just wipe it off. And, eh, it's pollen. George, let's move on to the news. Uh, the story of the week is the Missionary Diocese of All Saints has uh, released a, a PDF letter, and uh, we heard the sermon of Bishop Inglefritz. And I thought we would delve into a little bit of what he said, talk about the diocese, talk about its relationship within the ACNA, and our thoughts on it. First of all, how big is the diocese of the Missionary Diocese of All Saints, George? Bishop Ilgenfritz, William Ilgenfritz yep. is the bishop, Richard Lipke is the suffragan, and they oversee 34 congregations. It's a non-geographic diocese. They're spread across the United States. It's a small diocese. I believe it's the, one of the smallest, if not the smallest, of the ACNA diocese. Its origins came uh, under Richard Lipke, uh, uh, charismatic Episcopal church sure. groups. Yep came into the ACNA, and Bishop Ilgenfritz led uh, some congregations affiliated from the Episcopal Church that were in forward in faith. And so it's always been a traditionalist, Anglo-Catholic-oriented diocese. That's been its strength, its founding purpose, and but a few years in, it's now its weakness. Yes, it's its weakness. They're having trouble growing. Uh, obviously having trouble with money. I need to be clear here. Bishop Inglefretz and I are friends. Love the guy. Uh, so my reporting in this may be a little slanted. Uh, more slanted than usual, I should say. Um, their problem is what happens in the future. Uh, if we dissolve, obviously we can leave some of our churches with uh, the REC. Um, if we, or they get swallowed up somewhere else in the ACNA. Uh, but there's also the temptation to go outside the ACNA, George. Yes, in this uh, address to his uh, diocesan synod, which was held in Ocean City, Maryland, last Saturday, or Friday, I'm not sure yeah. which, Bishop Ilgenfritz recounted uh, the difficulties facing the diocese. He and Bishop Lipka are at retirement age. There's not the resources to basically hire a new full-time bishop. That wasn't said directly, but you could read between the lines. And... <clears throat> He stated that the Missionary Diocese of All Saints was made unwelcome in, within the ACNA. Uh, he started off by saying GAFCON had been a disappointment because it had done nothing about the consecration of a woman bishop in South Sudan, and that this was kept secret and that from GAFCON, then it was GAFCON was informed and Foley Beach kept it secret from the ACNA. And so GAFCON uh, was not the bulwark that they had hoped, and the ACNA's policy of dual integrities of allow some dioceses having women bishops, some not having women, I'm sorry, clergy, not bishops. I made a big mistake there. That's right, no problem. Um, That's what we call it, unscripted. Was not working. And some people within the ACNA House of Bishops and among other groups were being mean. 
So Anglo-Catholics were being victimized. They were uh, an oppressed minority. I agree with some of what he's saying. Oh, but let me just, I'm sorry, I jumped ahead. Uh, and then there was the third little bit, which is that we were invited to, we, Ilgen Fritz and Lipka, were invited to Dublin to meet with non-papal Catholics, the Union of Scranton people, the Polish National Catholic Church, the Nordic Catholic Church, and so on, to talk about perhaps union there. So what Bishop Ilkenfritz was saying is that it looks like we're either going to have to leave ACNA if we want to maintain our integrity over women's orders, or we're going to have to dissolve because we can't make a go of it. And he basically was trying to give his clergy a sense of where their future lay. And it wasn't a happy day speech. No. Well, there has been a lot of frustration this spring uh, over women's orders, dual integrity, and I think the problem is affinity to diocese. Remember early on, we started with uh, um, Bishop Eicher uh, saying, you know, there were promises made when we formed. And if I heard Bishop Duncan, Archbishop Duncan correctly, this is what I thought those promises were. Archbishop Duncan wrote back and said, I didn't quite say what you thought I said. And, you know, there's this, this discussion about, um, I think by now the the large Anglo-Catholic Episcopal body within the ACNA thought they could at least by now have met, discussed women's orders, they had this process going with the task force, and they would halt it. There would be a halt to, uh, at least for a period of time, to any first, uh, further women in the priesthood in the ACNA. That didn't happen for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. We weren't in the meeting. Um, and I see that frustration now uh, in the outskirts like MDAS, uh, Diocese of Fort Worth Forward in Faith, where they thought based on their large uh, Anglo-Catholic presence in the House of Bishops, they could ha affect and influence this discussion over women's orders. That didn't happen. We see the frustration, George. Yes, the they want uh, a decision. And the ACNA is not ready to make a decision. And politically, the ACNA is not in a good enough spot. If the ACNA says no more, says yes, we're going to continue as we're going. Some groups like the MDAS will decide, okay, we, this is not pure enough for us. We must go out and amalgamate with non-Anglicans. If they say, if the ACNA says no more women clergy, well, you may have what we're seeing here in Central Florida. Episcopal Diocese, we're getting requests from ACNA clergy to come on board. And we certainly would be a refuge for ACNA women clergy. Um, do you really want to have that as the... Uh, in other words, are you, do you want to press the issue now? Mm -hmm. Or do you want to allow the time to resolve this uh, in a way that we may not know the answer today, but uh, may be evident in years to come? So it's, it's, it's a really complicated situation that doesn't have many clear winners, as far as I can tell. Well, I think it's a symptom of the, big, the greater problem that affinity dioceses bring to this. Um, if you can have a diocese where you could just get to, uh, no matter where you are geographically, pick your bishop uh, who uh, agrees with you as much as possible uh, in, in your church and your polity and your, your discussion with women's orders, um, that really leads to a, uh, a part where you have one diocese that's small with 34 churches, another with 112 churches. And uh, right now, the strongest churches in the ACNA are geographical. Um, mm. it, it's just the way it is. And I think uh, there, was a, there was a desire but, for affinity to work, and this, it's clearly hasn't. Now, I, I want to add something in that Kevin and I are aware of, uh, Kevin, you and I are aware of, is that ever since uh, the ACNA was formed, there have people been on the conservative side outside the ACNA who have wanted to pull it down. Mm -hmm. And that this is this latest little thing with the uh, Dublin meeting uh, between Elgin Fritz and the others um, <clears throat> came about um, through people who want to pull the ACNA apart. They want to form uh, their own uh, version of uh, Anglicanism that, 
Well, what am I trying to say? Well, I don't want to name names. <laughs> no, we're not, not, not going to name names. Is, However, if you well, look, there's two people in that picture that was put out who are working against the ACNA, and they have for a long time. Um, it's a reality that um, when powers are put together and they, they work together at some point, I don't want to work with you anymore. I can do better. I can set up my own organization, and they step out to do so. And so it, Bishop Ilkenfit should be very careful about because he should be very careful in listening to people who have a vested interest in the destruction of the entity he's coming from that's right and who are basically saying look it's wonderful in the polish national catholic church mm -hmm. now bishop ilkenfritz is a german background i don't know how well he would fit into the mm -hmm. polish national yeah, catholic church yeah. but there are <laughs> other problems in the polish national catholic church that he would be stepping into if he wants to step out of the ACNA. The ACNA is a healthier body by far than any of these continuing groups or non-papal Catholic groups. And I just, this is a time I believe to exercise patience and humility and allow the Holy Spirit to lead and continue to build up the ACNA and not draw the line in the sand and demand an answer today. When you look globally at the churches provinces, um, denominations that are growing on the planet Earth, the ACNA is one of them, one of the few. The Polish, Pol Polish, sorry, the Polish Catholic Church, not one of them. Not a growing entity, unless it's trying to pull from other places. Um, and that's just the reality on the ground, you know. Uh, yes, you're going to get your perfect doctrine. You're going to be amongst a dozen people who perfectly agree with you on women's orders. Um, but you're, if you think you're a dying breed down in Florida or wherever MDAS is located, you'll be an even further dying breed uh, with these people in, in the Polish but to be fair to Bishop Ilgenfritz, it I don't disagree that the dual integrities concept yeah. is problematic yeah. of <clears throat> of having dioceses like Pittsburgh or uh, the diocese in which uh, Bishop Ilgenfritz is physically resident led uh, diocese of the Gulf Gulf Atlantic has women clergy and he couldn't in essence join that because he not, could not in good conscience celebrate with women priests. That's problematic. I mean, there's no tr there's no universal orders of the clergy in the ACNA, as in the Anglican Communion of the Episcopal Church. Now, but you have to ask yourself, is that the issue that I'm going to do break over, and what are the consequences of breaking, and will I be able, if I break, to be part of a viable ongoing institution? Okay, let's transition to our new story. <clears throat> Enough of that. The problem with discussing that is we have to f discuss affinity. We have to discuss dual orders. We have to discuss so much. The The problem with the story with Bishop Inglefritz is, yes, the grass is always greener somewhere else, but what George and I know about the, the Polish Catholic Church is, um, yeah, they're perfect on one issue. They got bigger messes on others. And, I mean, you and I could spend... Uh, an entire uh, month talking about troubles with, within the Orthodox Church, but they don't make their press dirty. They don't make dirty dirty laundry in in the public. Let's move on to apartheid, George. Um, I remember in the mid '80s, I was at the University of Wisconsin Madison, and they announced at the auditorium that Bishop Tutu, Archbishop Tutu, was coming to town, and if you get there soon enough, you can sit and listen to Bishop Tutu talk about uh, apartheid. And so the young gal I was dating at the time, Jill, said, oh, we got to go see Bishop Tutu. Now, Mark, at the time, we were not Episcopalian, we're not Anglican, but we went, and somehow we ended up in the front seat of the, of the auditorium. Don't know how it happened. He comes in, and he's shaking hands, and I got to shake Bishop Tutu's hands. Shortly after I shook his hand, about a year or two later, apartheid was all over. And I gave this man a lot of credit, des deserve it or not, um, and now I'm seeing that years later, despite the good that uh, Bishop Tutu did over apartheid, the country is starting to break up politically. Um, white versus black again, white versus African. And I thought, George and I need to talk about this because it's Anglican. But there's also a real big political story 
um, within the leadership in Africa, South Africa, that uh, is interesting. And uh, you and I in our pre-show got to talk about it. We should talk about it now, George. Why? Yeah. Okay, first of all, the big news last week was uh, there is a new leader in South Africa who introduced a bill that said all uh, white people who own far- farms, they're going to turn that over either to the people or to the government to be decided. Yeah, well, the uh, South, the there's a new president, Cyril Ramaphosa of South Africa. Mm-hmm. He's the new leader of the African National Congress Party. In the South African parliament, a member of one of the minority parties, Julius Malema, leader of the Economic Freedom Fighters, He's a former ANC cadre, and he's a Marxist, and he has long preached uh, war against the the the, uh, the whites, and he is on record saying that the time of reconciliation is over. Mm-hmm. Time now, time for us to get our revenge. One of the things when Nelson Mandela took over, and the why he was so lauded was that Nelson Mandela wanted to put the past behind South Africa, ha- allow the rule of law to take place. Julius Malema put forward a bill. Bishop Tutu was the same way. Yes, he, and he was one, he was one, one of the person, one vote, everybody. One of the, uh, the the bill put forward by Julius Malema says that the gov- to change the constitution to allow the government to take the land owned by white farmers away from them without compensation. And the Cyril and this passed. Uh, now, what's going on in South Africa? Cyril Ramaphosa, Ramaphosa is a former union leader who is now worth hundreds of billions of dollars, so he knows how to work the system. And he has supported uh, expropriation of land from the white farmers. Now, does he want to turn his country into another Zimbabwe, mm-hmm. meaning a basket case? And what's, what's going on politically? The ANC has made a total mess of South Africa, it, and they need to deflect uh, to deflect from their failure in leadership by basically energizing uh, their base to for racial hatred. And let one way to do it is take away the white farmers. Some of these white farmers have been on the land for four hundred years. Now, the Anglican Church has been silent on this issue. Part of it is because Archbishop Tabo Makoba is basically a weak man. He follows the lead of the ANC. He'll attack them for corruption. He'll follow the majority. But he's not like uh, Desmond Tutu, who will stand against the system uh, to proclaim the rights of people. He'll stand with the system and and chide it. So you've got the Anglican Church silent on this issue. And at the same time, we've had a blow up of clergy sexual abuse scandals. Uh, So South Africa's right now a mess. But to be perfectly honest, if you were a white man in South Africa, it's time to get out because you're basically now there on the sufferance. Is Cyril Ramaphosa hasn't signed this law and he may not do so because he's probably trying to work some deals. But basically your future, if you're a white farmer, is up to the whims of the president because the parliament has said uh, time for reconciliation is over, time to get our own back. The president is rich. He's worth 300 million bucks uh, because he spent years and years working with uh, the white farmers and white interest in the country and padded his pockets, worked with the unions and all that. Uh, So he's not going to sign this right away, but you have been shown the future of South Africa. Uh, the upcoming leadership doesn't want you there. And uh, George, quick lesson. Tell them what happened in Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe, uh, under white minority rule, it was the most uh, advanced. Uh, well, since uh, Robert Mugabe took office, mm-hmm. he started with, uh, with high hopes for everybody. Um, and in the since the early 80s until he was removed from office earlier this year, the country's been in a free fall. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, the life expectancy has dropped by 20 years. There's massive starvation. The farms that kept uh, Zimbabwe running were run by white settlers from Britain. 
th they've all been driven off their land without expropriate. The land was expropriated, given to political cronies of Robert Mugabe. And now Zimbabwe is a basket case. Uh, ten, hundreds of thousands of people have left and are living in other countries because they can't survive. It's a political dictatorship. It's, you know, it the... Uh, savings of people been wiped out because the Zimbabwe dollar is worthless. Uh, the, I think at one point it was like $100 billion inflation, you know. Yeah, it was. Basically, uh, what's happening in Venezuela right now happened in Zimbabwe. And the same arguments that are being put forward by people like Julius Malema are the ones put forward by Robert Mugabe. So South Africa, so the writing's on the wall, folks. Um, Unless the ANC is voted out of office and cooler heads prevail, uh, you're all in for a rough time. You are, and, and we talked about this. You know, we see the failure of the church of this. You know, in the 80s, the church, uh, in large part with uh, Desmond, tu uh, Desmond, sorry, uh, Bishop tu uh, Tutu, said this is the best way forward. There was one time where there, I don't remember exactly, but in this big concert area, uh, and th they wanted to have a, re a revolution, just clear out the white people, and Desmond Tutu stopped that. Uh, and and with Nelson Mandela, that yeah. that they they weren't going to uh, basically. This was going to be a nonviolent revolution. That they were going to be a you know we're going to live together and build a better South Africa. Those days are over. If, Julie, if Julius Malema is the future, that's right of massive unemployment, massive problems with crime, uh, massive failure of the state, and massive corruption. And the Anglican Church has basically been in the pocket of the ANC. Um, the white clergy and bishops basically are either too frightened, you can't say anything, or they're the sort of white liberals who basically uh, agree with what's going on. And the... Uh, Kevin, we've reported on the problems within the South African church about the Diocese of Um yeah. where the bishop was under investigation for corruption. And, oh, my goodness, my cathedral and all the records burned down the day before the auditors came. Yeah. Um, there's a South African church is a corrupt church in many respects. Um, but its archbishop is admired by liberals in the West because he's one of these smooth-talking people who always uh, uh, seems to come out... Uh, smelling like a rose no matter how bad the situation is now whether he's going to survive this latest clergy sex scandal whether he's going to survive the destruction of his country by their government i don't know yeah but uh man oh. it's it's not a good yeah i'm sorry to throw these two stories on you guys on a friday but uh yeah do pray for the missionary diocese of the south uh and the bishop uh obviously pray for the acna uh, pray for the growing church, whatever denomination, that people will be saved. And keep your eye on what's going to happen in South Africa. They are also in need of our prayers. Um, it doesn't take anything at all to turn into another Zimbabwe where billions of dollars are just, you know, shuffled off into corruption. It, it's the way it is. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger. And you've been watching episode 381 of Anglican Unscripted.